So we're going to do this with a proof by contradiction, but before we begin, let's just talk about inverse elements. So just let's take a concrete example. So we'll take the free cycle one, two, three. This, of course, can be split down into this composition of transpositions here. So one, two, followed by one, three. Now, if you want the inverse element to this, all you actually need to do is reverse the order of the transpositions. So this is one of the ways in which breaking an element down into a composition of transpositions is incredibly beautiful because if you want to invert it, you can then just inverse all the transpositions. So actually the inverse of this element is just gonna be do this transposition first followed by this because remember to invert this, what you want to do is send all of these elements back to where they came from. So actually all you want to do is do all of the transpositions in reverse order. So here's what's happening here. So if we take our original element, which is this, which is here, and then we compose it with this new element we've got by uh, reversing the transpositions, the order of the transpositions, here is the pictorial representation of this element here. But actually, even just looking at this, you can work out what's going to happen because the composition of these elements is associative. It's composition of permutations, which is always associative. So we can then imagine doing this composition first. So you can imagine putting brackets here and here and composing these two elements together. When you compose a transposition with itself, it becomes the identity. So those effectively just vanish. And then this becomes one, two composed with one, two. And again, that's just transposition composed with transposition, which again is the identity. So overall, this is going to give the identity. And that is the reason that this element here, uh, one three composed with one two is the inverse to one two composed with one three. And this goes for much more complicated permutations that are made up of much more transpositions that if you want to invert them, all you need to do is reverse the order of the transpositions. And you can imagine what will happen is they'll just cancel off one after the other as you go out, they'll cancel. So one three will cancel with one three, one two will cancel with one two, and then if you've got more, whatever's here will cancel with whatever's here and onwards, and then it will end up just being the identity. So decomposition into transpositions has this beautiful, gives this very beautiful, easy to understand version of the inverse. So just to make this a little bit more abstract, if we say A is our arbitrary permutation, and here is its breakdown into transpositions. So we've got transposition one, transposition two, all the way up to transposition N, where N is some natural number, maybe it could be 10, maybe it could be 20, etc. Uh, then A inverse is just going to be all of these transpositions in the opposite order. So you need to do TN first, then you'll do TN minus one, etc all the way up to finally t1 and then if you think about a inverse composed with a which again we read that as do a first and then do a inverse uh, then here is a here is then a inverse and you can see that transposition n is going to be composed with transposition n you can use associativity here and those two will just cancel Tn minus 1 will cancel with Tn minus 1, etc., all the way down to T2 cancelling with T2 and T1 cancelling with T1 to give the identity. And of course, you could trans you could compose these two in the opposite order. So you could do A, A inverse, and then it would work just the same. It, instead, you'd have the T1s at the centre here and the Tn's at the outside. This also makes clear that the inverse element will have the same parity as the element. So whatever the parity of A is, the parity of A inverse will be the same. So if A is odd, A inverse will be odd. If A is even, A inverse will be even. So let's begin our proof, and it's going to be a proof by contradiction. So let's assume we have our element A here, which is some permutation, and let's now assume incorrectly that it can be broken down into two different decompositions one of which has an even number of transpositions and one of which has an odd number of transpositions. And let's arrive at a contradiction. So here we go. Here is the decomposition into an even number of transpositions up here. So A is equal to T1 composed with T2 all the way up to Tn where these Ts are transpositions. And we're going to assume that N is an even number. So this is a decomposition into an even number of transpositions. And below here we have another decomposition. 
we're using S's here. These are also transpositions, not quite as good letter choice, but what can you do? Uh, so it's S1 composed with S2 all the way up to Sm, and we're now going to assume that M is an odd number. So we've got one even decomposition and one odd decomposition. Now, if this decomposition is true, then we can write A inverse as S1 all the way down to Sm, where this means Sm followed by Sm minus 1 all the way up to S1. That's what we've just argued. So this is the inverse of this. But if this is the inverse of A, then if we compose this with A, where we can use this original uh, decomposition into an even number of transpositions, then that should give the identity element. So that means that if we write this down, A inverse composed with A, which remember the way our notation works, it means do A first and then do A inverse. This is going to be T1 followed by T2 all the way up to Tn, and then we're going to do Sm, Sm minus 1 all the way up to Sm. And this composition, which is a great big composition of transpositions, this should give the identity element. Now there is a big problem with this, because if you look at how many transpositions are here, the number of these T transpositions, T1 all the way up to Tm, we said n was even, so there's an even number there. If we look at the number of S transpositions here, we said that there were an odd number of those. So overall, this is an even plus odd. So overall, you have an odd number of transpositions being composed here to make the identity. So you've got a decomposition of the identity into an odd number of transpositions. So actually, we can disprove this being possible, and indeed we can prove our entire theorem just by proving that the identity element is always even, never odd. So here, if you like, is a picture of the identity element where everything is fixed. It, if you like, is made up of zero transpositions. But in fact, we have another decomposition here of the identity element which contains two transpositions. So you can think of it as one, two composed with itself this is two transpositions making the identity. And you could make even more silly, longer uh, compositions of transpositions that would give the identity. And they're always going to be even decompositions. They're always going to have an even number of transpositions. You cannot take an odd number of transpositions, compose them all together, and I guarantee you, you will never get the identity. If you're going to compose transpositions together and get the identity, it's always going to be an even number of transpositions, or you didn't bother in the first place and you compose zero transpositions together. So the identity is an even element. If we prove that the identity has to be an even element, and that will require some proof, and we'll do that in just a moment, then we have proven our entire theory that parity is well-defined and that an element can only have even or odd decompositions. If it had both, then it would be the case that the identity could have an odd decomposition into transpositions.